Koinonia House is a nonprofit Christian ministry that is supported by the purchasing of materials and donations. To learn more about Koinonia House and the materials that we have available, visit khouse.org. And please be responsible in the sharing and dissemination of this information and respect the copyrights therein. Thank you. Well, welcome to our second session as we explore the realm of angels. And uh, in the previous section, we talked about the realm in general and we highlighted what we call the Berean challenge. And that's to, first of all, set aside our misconceptions. You know, all of us inherently have perceptions coming from fiction, from traditions, uh, from uh, literature about angels. And so a part of our problem in, uh, in taking a subject like this is to set aside <coughs> our misconceptions about our physical reality. Most of us have been substantially mistaught uh, by the uh, misguided uh, programs in schools. Uh, we haven't taken advantage of the advances of science where we've learned a great deal, some shocking things about the reality of our, what we call our reality, our physical reality. And uh, we covered some of that in the first session to try to set a, a groundwork against which to try to understand this strange world that I call the metacosm that world which is beyond the specific boundaries of the reality that we experience. Well, and so we're now going to, in this session, move into biblical angels. We're going to talk about their characteristics and limitations that we know from the truth of the Bible. And uh, we'll talk about some of the specific major players we encounter there. So session one was just the groundwork from last time. This time we're going to get right into biblical angels, uh, not fiction, not English, uh, English literature, not the silly little things you see on uh, Christmas cards or, or Renaissance art and so forth, but the reality of these creatures that are incredibly powerful and are there to minister to us, strangely enough. We need to understand that. Biblical angels, and uh, the first thing we have to focus on, what do we know for certain? We're not going to rely on occult literature. We're not going to rely on the non-biblical sources that pervade our libraries. But uh, there are ancient records that support the concept of the Nephilim, these strange hybrids of the past. Every major culture deals with this, and we'll be talking about that after we've set a little more groundwork for it. But we're going to focus on the biblical sources, the Holy Bible as a, a uh, source of information that has uniquely confirmed itself by the fact that you can demonstrate that its origin is uh, of extraterrestrial origin. It is, it is uh, supernatural in its source. And it, of course, talks about angels all through it. What can angels actually do? And uh, we're going to talk about their capabilities and also what they can't do, some of the limitations. And so, we're going to talk about some super angels, angels that are extraordinary, called cherubim and seraphim. Uh, we'll talk about guardian angels. I always thought that was just a, a nursery tradition. No, it turns out they're biblical. Jesus makes reference to them and so forth. So, and we're going to talk about the major star players, two of them that we actually know their names. They have job descriptions in effect, Gabriel and Michael. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go here. But the word angel in the Hebrew, malach, actually is simply one who is dispatched with a message. And uh, we uh, see that term used 196 times in the scripture. Over 100 times, it's referred to as angels in the sense of a supernatural messenger of some kind. But 98 times, it's just the word messenger. The term can be used just for a messenger and four times it's even used for ambassadors. So the term has its own ambiguities. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament and in the New, the word is angelos. And uh, that, uh, again, that means a messenger or an envoy, uh, somebody who is sent uh, implicitly from God. And uh, 179 times it's translated angels, uh, seven times just as messengers. And uh, the, the seven letters, seven churches make reference to these, and some scholars think they're just the name for the pastor of those churches, but most scholars, I think, ascribe a supernatural role to them. And so, the ministry of angels, what do they actually do? What are they there for? And uh, 
we know from Hebrews 1 that they continually serve those who will inherit salvation. And if you're one of those, the angels are there to serve you, whether you realize it or not. They're real. It's not just a euphemism or a cliche. They're very alive and real. They uh, reveal unknown truth. There's a number of places in the book of Daniel and also the book of Acts where angels reveal something you didn't know before. Uh, they give personal guidance all through the New Testament. They uh, protect you from harm. There are cases where you are protected from harm. You may not even realize it. And uh, they deliver us from our enemies in Acts, uh, several places, and so forth. That's their ministry. And uh, it may be invisible, but it's very, very, uh, actually tan has tangible results. And uh, we see angels encouraging and strengthening. Jacob was encouraged in uh, Genesis 32. <coughs> Daniel, all through the book of Daniel, he is ministered uh, by angels in Daniel 8 and 10. And so we're going to look at some of those specifically for their illumination. Paul, of course, had frequent encounters with angels. And uh, they provided food for Elijah back in 1 Kings. We see them all through the Bible, ministering, helping, providing, shielding, strengthening. And so angels guide us ourselves. We learn from Genesis 19. They encourage us in Judges 6. And uh, the angels deliver us, as in Acts 12 and elsewhere. And they enlighten us and they <coughs> empower us. Uh, when you have a duty or a requirement, angels often are dispatched to facilitate that empowerment and to protect us. Now, this protection thing um, can be very, very real. And I'm going to recount to you a, a incident that occurred not many weeks ago to me personally. And uh, I was uh, uh, in uh, Auckland for a critical meeting. I, because it was so critical, I arrived there the night before, stayed at a, uh, a convenient motel in anticipation of a very key meeting the following morning. <coughs> I woke up early, still dark, and it was raining. And I uh, went down to uh, the place that would probably open for breakfast shortly. And as I went down there, I did something very foolish. I took a little shortcut, slipped on some rocks, and had a very, very bad fall. And uh, I, uh, uh, as I realized I had really done something pretty stupid, had a very bad fall, I, re I realized I couldn't see out of my left eye. It was starting to swell. And uh, uh, to make a long story short, I thought I had lost the sight of my left eye. Fortunately, it just got very, very swollen, and, and it turned out later we discovered it wasn't that serious. But we also, when I later uh, talked to doctors, it was clear that my glasses had protected my eye from any damage. I had a very, very severe head shock, but it, uh, um, there was no damage to the cornea or the retina or any of that. There was no actual eye damage, even though the swelling kept me from seeing for a while. And uh, what protected my eye clearly from the scarring was my glasses. But as I began to assemble the events of my mind, what I was startled to realize as I, after I fell, I obviously had to find my glasses. And uh, my glasses, actually, when I finally had enough light to see better and so forth, my glasses were, um, oh, more than 10 yards away, neatly put on a little ledge, which I picked up and put on. And uh, later on discovered it was the glasses that had protected my eye from more serious damage. And as we tried to later reconstruct what actually happened, how I fell and what really happened, the more we tried to do that, the more puzzling it was because it was clear that the glasses had protected my eye and yet they were a substantial distance from where I fell. And uh, it may sound very corny and, s and, and, and so forth, but I really believe that I had the experience of Psalm uh, 91. In verse 11 and 12, it says, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And I was st really startled to realize, as I tried to reconstruct the events of that, the, the darkness of that early morning, uh, that uh, the, the, the protection I had kept me from having a serious injury. It could have been very, very, very serious. I ended up going to the meeting all right. It just looked like I had a a swollen back, uh, <laughs> I've been in a bad fight or something. We didn't realize the seriousness of it until later and, and as the doctors analyzed it and so forth. But fortunately, there was no permanent damage and it, as, 
And it's also, what's strange is the, the very glasses I'm wearing were the ones that somehow protected my, the eye itself. For what it's worth, it, I suspect there are many, many times that were beneficiaries of intervention by angels that we're not even aware of. And we become aware of that only by really studying and realizing what God is doing and understand his purposes. Now, the characteristics of angels. Angels are not abstractions or concepts. They are actual personal beings. What do I mean by that? They have intellect, we learn from Matthew 28 and 1 Peter 1. Uh, they have emotions. They care. In Job 38 and Luke 2 and 15, we find references to that. They have will. They make choices. They can make bad choices, and we'll discover the, the results of some of the angels' bad choices as we mature in the, in the study a little further. And so, not only are they personal, but they're also spirit beings. What do I mean by that? They are not limited to material bodies. They are distinctive in that they can materialize, but um, they also are not limited to what we would consider a material body. They can only be in one place at one time. They're not ubiquitous. They're not like God who can be everywhere. They have locality, and they can only be in one place at one time. We learn from several passages. They appear, when we see them, they usually appear in the form of men. We don't see any case where they appear as a woman, despite the use of that idiom in literature and so forth. They always appear in the form of men, sometimes in natural sight with uh, human functions. In Genesis 18, we see that, and, uh, and the chapter following, chapter 19. Sometimes the angels are seen by some and not others. And we, uh, we saw an ex uh, example of that in 2 Kings 6 and so forth. We do know they do not reproduce, nor do they die. They can engage in reproductive mischief, and we'll talk about some specific cases of that from the biblical text as we go. Now, they do have physical reality. We need to understand that. They lead people by the hand in Genesis 19. They actually indulge in combat. And there's a rather remarkable case of that in 2 Kings 19. Let's take a look at it here. Where they slaughtered 185,000 Syrians. In 2 Kings chapter 19, in verse 35, it indicates that it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians, 104 score and 5 is the old English way of what we would say today of 185,000. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So this was a serious assault. In fact, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, never after that ever attacked Jerusalem again. He was under the unique protection, and uh, uh, that was a, a, a major event in that adversary. And so Sennacherib never again uh, undertook an invasion of Jerusalem. They had previously wiped out the northern kingdom, but in going against the southern kingdom, uh, God, pr God protected them. We're advised in the New Testament, many of us have entertained angels unawares. That's a very strange idea, but it's in Hebrews 13 too, where Paul tells us, be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Strange idea. Not only can they appear as people, we could mistake them as people. They're able to do that. That's a capability they have. And uh, that may be strange in the absence of the background we gave you in the first session, but we'll keep moving here. And uh, angels have attributes in a degree greater than man, but less than God. We make mistakes both ways. Um, they have more knowledge than man, but less than God, and they have more power than man, but less than God. So it's, uh, on the one hand, we need to understand their reality, but we also need to be sensitive to their limitations. And uh, angels are organized. They're not random individuals on assignments. They are ranked and organized. One, there's one archangel. We use the term archangel. There's actually one. His name happens to be Michael. And he's named in, in uh, Jude 9, and he shows up in Paul's letters also. And uh, there are also chief princes. In other words, in some sense, some are more senior than others. We'll explore a reference to that when we get into Daniel chapter 10. And uh, there's a certain kind of angel 
that we call a cherubim. In the Hebrew, I think it's cherubim. It's, a, it's, it's got a, a, a hard C, but we have a tendency to take the CH softly, the cherubim. A cherub is singular. Cherubim is the plural. And uh, it's, a, it's a, a cherub, biblically, is not a little plump baby with wings, as is so often characterized in Renaissance art. That's a literary fiction concept that uh, it is, it is, it couldn't be more distant. Uh, uh, it wouldn't be possibly be more distant than that. Uh, the reality is, and and in fact, uh, cherubim are assigned to guard the way to the tree of life when Adam is kicked out of the Garden of Eden. So there's something very powerful and very fundamental about the cherubim. Uh, and uh, in fact, one of the cherubim, one of the cherubs was in charge of all the rest and got carried away on an ego trip. And we know that one as Satan, and he'll be a, a special focus of our study, of course, as we go on here. We also encounter, especially in the book of Isaiah, in fact, only in this book of Isaiah, a, a, uh, a flaming one of some kind called a seraphim. And the very uh, uh, word implies a source of light, a, a, a like he's a, a, a source of brightness. And he, he, we encounter him in Isaiah 6. It's the only place we do. But I, I'll show you why I think that's synonymous with the creatures that we see in Revelation 4. In Revelation 4, we find some living creatures described that appear to be very much identical with what Isaiah called seraphim in Isaiah 6. And so we'll be looking at these more carefully. The major players, of course, there's the first major player I want to talk about is a source of a lot of confusion. Frequently in the Old Testament, we read of the angel of the Lord. And most scholars infer from what we know about them that those references are not angel in the diminutive sense, but it's an idiom of an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ before his incarnation. Um, when you don't really understand something, you give it a fancy name. So scholars call those theophanies or Christophanies. In other words, it's an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. Before Bethlehem, before he became a man and dwelt among us, he was able to appear and uh, participate in a number of events. And that when he does so, uh, the term that we find in the text has been translated the angel of the Lord. I want to emphasize that because what we know about him, it goes far beyond what we usually find out about angels. And so we'll call the, the theophanies are in a special category, if you will. And, uh, but in the realm of angels, as we think of angels, Gabriel is one of the most frequently encountered guys. And we, as we study his uh, assignments and his actions, we discover by inference that he appears to be primarily a, a messianic messenger. He's usually announcing something that has something directly to do with the advent of the Messiah, the, the Christ, if you will, uh, in the Old Testament and the New. That seems to be his, his main job. Another angel that has a name, and apparently a, a, we can infer his job description, is a guy by the name of Michael. And uh, he is clearly a military leader on behalf of Israel. All his assignments are directly labeled in, in, in those terms. We're going to explore these senior ranks of angels, cherubim, seraphim, and so forth, as a group. Um, we're going to discover that they have four faces, and those four faces are in common to each category, strangely enough. And there's something very uh, peculiar about th that insignia, those four faces that we associate with the cherubim. One of those cherubim turned bad got an ego trip and wanted to be equal to God. And, and uh, he had a career that we're going to explore especially. He goes by the name of Lucifer or more commonly Satan. He is designated in the text that at one time he was the cherub that covereth. In other words, the one in charge. And it's from there that he got into trouble and he took some lieutenants with him. We're going to talk about Abaddon and Apollyon, which are terms that mean the destroyer. And uh, we'll also talk about Gog, the king of the locusts, and uh, what are what's all that about. And we'll discover they are apparently some of his senior lieutenants under him, but perhaps 
a notch more powerful than the rest. We will we'll learn that about a third of the angels uh, were involved in that conspiracy that caused them uh, to get cast out. So we're also going to explore a creature that we call demons, and we're going to discover that demons are different than angels. Angels and demons appear to have different limitations, different characteristics, and we'll ex be exploring all of those. In fact, in it we'll devote our next session to that. And uh, the first of these, right on down uh, through the uh, senior ranks and so forth, we will deal in this session. And it, it we want to leave these other darker topics to a separate session that will follow this one, se we'll session three, which will usher in the second half of our four-part series on angels. But the angel of the Lord, let's talk a little bit about that guy. When, when we, we at, to Hagar, we discover that uh, in Genesis 16, she identifies him as the Lord. An angel visits her and, and ministers to her. To Abraham himself, when uh, the birth of Isaac was announced in Genesis 18, uh, when he was about to sacrifice Isaac in Genesis 22, we see an angelic encounter, but the most scholars infer from details in, in the text that those were actually the angel of the Lord, or an idiom, if you will, of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And uh, we see to Jacob, we find he wrestles with an angel until he gets his blessing in that strange episode in Genesis 31. And there again, whether it was that a normal angel or was it indeed the Lord himself? Scholars have divided opinions about that. And of course to Moses at the burning bush. We, Moses has this encounter with the Lord and we get the impression from John chapter 8 that Jesus identifies himself with that voice of the burning bush and the I am statement that was there given in uh, Exodus chapters 3 and 4. And so those are Old Testament appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ himself and not to be confused with the messengers that populate many of the other passages. He appears to Israel, of course. He led the Israels out of Egypt in Exodus 14 and he led Israel through the wilderness for 38 years or nominally 40 years uh, in, in, the, in the rest of the Torah there. He appears to Balaam and his talking donkey in Numbers 22. Joshua as he, he approaches Jericho in Joshua 5. Joshua, at the end of chapter 5, is uh, after dinner apparently, encounters a stranger and challenges him like a sentry. And the stranger identifies himself uh, uh, to Joshua by asking him to take off his shoes. He's on holy ground. And of course, Joshua realizes that reminds him of the episode he had previous with uh, Moses at the burning bush and some 40 years earlier. And we begin to realize that the personage at the end of Joshua chapter 5 is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. When they ask you who fought the battle of Jericho, despite the musical, it wasn't Joshua, it was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And that gets to be very, very relevant for us to understand because almost every rule of the Torah is violated in the attack on Jericho. Uh, they didn't rest the seventh day. They marched seven times around and so forth. They kept silence for six of the days. It was at the last time that they shouted and the walls came down. When you start studying the conquest of Jericho in the, uh, in the book of Joshua, you discover, if you look carefully, that it's an outline of the book of Revelation with the decimal point moved over, so to speak. And uh, so the, uh, the, the role of the leader there is very key. Uh, in many, many ways, and that's a study in its own right, but recognize that's far more than an angel that encountered uh, Joshua there uh, in Jericho. Gideon's call as a judge in Judges 6. Samson's mother, Manoah, has an encounter there again, if you study that passage carefully. The implications are that it's far more than a normal angel that was there. And so, so let's shift and talk about a specific guy by the name of Gabriel, probably one of our favorites, because he's always on some very, very pleasant errands. And uh, he, he, he identifies himself in the New Testament, Luke chapter 1. He says, I am Gabriel who stand in the presence of God. What a privilege. So he's one of the insiders. He's a key guy. And uh, he was the angel that was sent to Daniel to explain the vision of the ram and the goat. Very key visits in Daniel chapter 8. And perhaps even more profoundly in J Daniel chapter 9, he's the one that gives Daniel the fabled 70-week prophecy. He tells Daniel the exact day that the Messiah was going to emerge to present himself as a king to Jerusalem. 
And when you get to Luke 19, you discover what we call the triumphal entry. You discover it is on the very day that Gabriel had told Daniel so um, so many centuries before. So Gabriel was the one that delivered that. And uh, he's also the one that announced the birth of John the Baptist, the advanced uh, advanced guy for the Lord Jesus himself. And then, of course, he announced the birth of the Messiah to Mary in Luke chapter 1 also. So he's always announcing things. He's the... uh, press agent, so to speak. He's the one that uh, is the advanced guy. And, but it's always in some way directly related to the advent of the uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, now the other guy that we see prominently named and, and is out there with us is a guy by the name of Michael. And uh, I want you to notice with Gabriel, there's no blowing of horns. I don't know where Gabriel blow your horn. You see some of these things getting to... Uh, into, into the uh, uh, tongue-in-cheek uh, comedy world have nothing to do with the, bi- the biblical truth. And Michael's another one. Michael is not rowing a boat anywhere. I don't know where they even get the basis for, for, for the parodies, if you will. No, Michael is a key guy. He is the archangel. And uh, we see him so identified in Jude 9, and he's the guy that calls us in the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4, the voice of the archangel. That's Michael. And uh, so uh, there's a, a lot of scholastic debate. Of what is it you're going to hear at the rapture? Well, apparently it's Michael's voice. What is he calling? I believe he calls us each by name. I think we'll hear our name called. Just I think the model there is when uh, Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb. But uh, he, in any case, is a military leader on behalf of Israel. And he is so identified. Uh, he's one of the chief princes in Daniel 10. And we're going to look at that later. He's described as your prince. In other words, he's a prince, a leader, an angelic leader, specifically uh, for uh, uh, the Jewish interests, for Israel. And uh, uh, in Daniel 12, he's the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. There again, uh, the children of thy people, that's a King James term. In the International Standard Version, they've done something interesting. The uh, the children of Israel phrase in the King James has been translated in the Inter- International Standard Version as Israelis. I like that. That's pretty cool. And uh, so, so, and uh, when we get to Revelation chapter 12, there's a summary chapter that sort of summarizes the career of Satan. And we'll be studying that in some detail in the next session. But we'll notice there that there's a war in heaven described. In verse 7 of chapter 12, there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against, and it was the dragon, and it was Satan and his angels. So there's a war in heaven, but the adversary of Satan is Michael and his angels. So Michael is a a, a commander of a military host of angels. Powerful guy, and uh, on behalf of Israel. And uh, people say, aren't you worried about Israel when we visit there a lot? No, I'm not worried about Israel because he that keepeth Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. That, of course, is referring to God, but I think it also includes Michael. And so there is a strange thing about Michael, though, that raises a lot of questions because when we get to the book of Jude, there's a strange allusion that Jude makes in his letter. He's speaking of apostasy and so forth. He says, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. So the point that Jude is is going to make is that we should not speak evil of of dignities. Whether we agree with them or not, we don't speak evil of them. But the example he uses has to be one of the strangest examples in the entire Bible. The example of the dignity he uses is none other than Satan. And he says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. In other words, Michael apparently is in a contest with Satan over the body of Moses. And that leads to a whole bunch of scholastic conjectures. What, that all, what is that really all about? Nobody knows. It's the only illusion we have. Jude's readers apparently were aware of this because he uses this as an example to make another point. But yet Michael the archangel, there he is identified, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. And even in that contest, he lets the Lord deal with Satan. He doesn't uh, deal with him directly in some sense. 
Now, why is he disputing with Satan or the body of Moses? We don't know. That's a whole area of conjecture. And uh, he disputed about the body of Moses. We do know that Moses did appear at the transfiguration in Matthew 17. And both Moses and Elijah uh, appear in the transfiguration. And we also suspect for a number of reasons that Moses will be one of the two witnesses that makes an appearance in Revelation 11. And so most scholars assume that this, in some sense, relates to those appearances. But that leads to a lot of other conjectures that go beyond our interest here. These super angels that we're dealing with here, we have the cherubim. And we'll notice in the references to cherubim, they appear to have four wings. Not just two as usually pictured, but they're described as having four. And uh, they guard the tree of life in Genesis 3. And they, they adorn the mercy seat, and uh, not only on the mercy seat in gold, but also over them in, in, in very large manner in, in Solomon's temple. So they're used idiomatically quite frequently. Now the seraphim we encounter in Isaiah 6 have six wings, not four. Is that a big deal? Don't know. But uh, it clearly it's a distinctive. And, and, and uh, Isaiah has a very, very key um, uh, opportunity to see the throne of God. And he describes it in the sixth chapter of Isaiah. And it's, it's, we don't know how many seraphim there are. There's a plurality of them, obviously. More than three. In Hebrew, a plural is always three or more. And uh, so in the Greek, especially in Revelation chapter 4, we're going to encounter zoon, which is the Greek term. It should be translated living creatures. Some of your Bibles translated uh, beasts. It's not that word in the Greek at all, and that needs to be correct. The King James has a mistake. Uh, in the vision of the throne of God that uh, John sees and while he's on Patmos is recorded in uh, Revelation chapters 4 and 5. And we encounter, we, he encounters there these living things, these living creatures. And the Greek term he uses is zoon, not therion. Therion is a vicious beast. The beast in Revelation 13 is a different word. The living creatures in chapter 4 is the word zoon. So uh, there's some confusion that gets created in the King James because they use the, the translators use the word beast in both places, and that's unfortunate. But let's take a look. There are two chapters that are quite detailed about the cherubim, the throne of God as seen in the Old Testament, uh, especially by Ezekiel. And it's a combination throne chariot thing. It knows about, it's all about Ezekiel and his wheels. And uh, what I've taken the liberty of decorating my slide here with a reminder from our first session. We're going to be, I believe we're going to be dealing in what's called hyperspaces. Spaces of more than three dimensions. You and I are familiar with Euclidean space, length with height. We're used to a three-dimensional space. But hyperspaces are spaces with more than three. So we can have a two-dimensional cube, we can have a three-dimensional cube, we can have a four-dimensional cube. And the one thing we discover when you go up a dimension beyond the dimensions we're familiar with, it's very non-intuitive. So I've taken the liberty of decorating the slide with a, a four-dimensional cube unraveled in three dimensions that we talked about last session, and also a Kalao uh, 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 manifold, which again is a hyperspace kind of rep rep representation for mathematics. I put them on the slide just to remind us that we're moving into what I believe is a space of more than three dimensions. And so let's go into Ezekiel chapter 1. The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. So this comes out of the north. It's very interesting. I'm not quite sure why, but the word north is usually used, idiomatically at least, to represent God and the source. Satan aspires to be on the sides of the north, whatever that means. And I don't think it means a, a, I don't think it's a geocentric term. I think it's something uh, much larger, but that's a speculation on my part. But it's usually, that term is frequently used in Scripture to point toward the throne of God for some reason. And uh, so why is it? I'm not sure. But moving on. And uh, so, and the brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, 
as the color of amber out of the midst of fire. Whenever we see the throne of God, whether it's here or in Isaiah 6, it's always a source of light. Uh, flames, fire, or idiomatic. That very word seraphim implies that. God, or God is a consuming fire, we're told in Hebrews 12. God is light, John reminds us in his letters. And uh, uh, Paul, at the time of his conversion, saw a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun. In fact, many scholars believe that's where he got his eye problem. He apparently suffered from some eye problems later that seem that we assume may have had something to do with the Damascus Road experience. And so, moving on. And out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Now, four living creatures. And these are the cherubim that we're going to uh, see uh, amplified also in chapter 10. And uh, so, the, uh, the likeness of man. Likeness means it's similar, but not identical with. Be careful with that word likeness. It's a, talking about a simile here. It's not a sin in them. Likeness expresses general form, appearance, a particular aspect. So the two terms are both appear here. And uh, likeness appears 10 times, uh, the word for appearance 14 times. They're not exactly the same. One is more specific than the other. And uh, the prophet senses the inadequacy of human speech to describe what we would call the ineffable. The ineffable. There's no way to express what he's going to deal with. He's going to do the best he can. It says, every one had four faces and every one had four wings. So they each had four faces, each had four wings of the cherubim here. And we're going to talk a lot about these four faces later on. And uh, when we get to uh, verse 10, they'll be identified for us. And their feet were straight feet. The sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. They, and they four had their faces and their wings. And uh, the wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went everyone straight forward. Strange terms. Not sure exactly what it means, but it's going to be emphasized again and again throughout these accounts. And uh, the creatures, we believe, symbolize the glory and power of God. They turn not when they went. We know from James that in God there's no variables or turning. That's an optical term, meaning the absence of parallax, which is mathematically the same thing as being at infinity. And uh, no parallax. The focus is at infinity. And uh, so they apparently could see in all directions and move in all directions without turning. And uh, that's sort of the, the implication here. And uh, as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and the four had the face of an ox. On the left side, they four also had the face of an eagle. So there's a man, a lion, and a, uh, an ox, and an eagle. We're going to see these four faces show up again and again and again in the strangest ways. So just um, put that in your notes. The face of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. We'll explore that later. They seem to have some major significance, if nothing else, in the architecture of the Bible itself. And we'll go through that as we go. Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went, every one straight forward. Whither the Spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not when they went. And uh, that's a strange. Again, that may be uh, just a hint of the hyperdimensionality that we're dealing with here. I'm not sure. And uh, they turned not when they went. See, God is moving forward un undeviatingly, unhesitatingly toward the accomplishment of his purpose in the world today. We need to understand that. Nothing will deter God from what he's going to accomplish. Nothing can sidetrack him at all. It's part of the thought that may be included here. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. In other words, a source of light. They went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright and out of the fire went forth lightning. So... Someone doing a movie here with special effects could go wild here, but uh, as like burning coals of fire. And God is light, of course. And, and Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. These idioms are not accidental. They're probably very, very carefully chosen. And uh, 
And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. And the appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of beryl. And, they, and the four had one likeness. Their appearance and their work was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Now that isn't very helpful. The more you think about that, it could mean any of a lot of different things. We think of wheels in many contexts, of course. Of the wheels of the throne of the Ancient of Days is a reference from Daniel 7. Um, uh, it, it was obviously very prevalent in the bases of the, of Sol of the furniture in Solomon's temple. And uh, the chariot in First uh, Chronicles 28. Wheels seem to be, uh, could be wheels as we think of them, or it may hit be their attempt to describe something that neither of us are familiar with. And when they went, they went upon the four sides, and they turned not when they went. There's that phrase again. They turned not when they went. And again, this may be a, a constriction of our misunderstanding of the dimensionality they're in. And God is a God of intelligent purpose. You and I are not living in a universe that is moving in the future aimlessly and without purpose. And there's another fundamental we haven't spent a lot of time on, but I want to underscore it as we go here. Random, randomness does not exist in nature. There are two concepts in mathematics that we cannot find in the physical world. One is infinity. We can describe it, we can postulate about it, but we can't find any examples of it. The universe is not infinite and large, and we can't even get infinitely small. We can't get below Planck's constant in smallness. Um, so so inf infinity doesn't is uh, elusive in our physical world. The other concept that you can't find, amazingly, is randomness. And uh, that's what led to a new field of mathematics called the theory of chaos. That randomness itself, if you pursue it, turns out to be quite uh, elusive. So it does not seem to exist in nature. God has a purpose in everything he does. God has a purpose for every atom which he has created, and he has a purpose for you. And the very fact that you and I are alive today reveals that we are to accomplish a purpose for God. We have no idea what that might be. But uh, uh, clearly, he has a purpose for everything he has done. And he's created you, and he has a purpose for you. And that's the great adventure in life, is to discover what it is. Moving on, as for their wings, they were so high that they were dreadful. And their rings were full of eyes, round about them four. And uh, so they're full of eyes. That's an idiom expressing the omniscience of God as he rules his creation. And the movements of his wheels and cherubim are congruent with his omniscience. And uh, all this speaks of God's constant working in the world, his power, his glory, his purpose for man as providence is all wrapped up in these idioms here in the, uh, dealing with the throne of God itself. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. And uh, they sp this, all this seems to speak of ceaseless activity and the energy of God. And whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go. The wheels were lifted up over and against them. The spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. And so they guarded the throne of God, as we will see in chapter 4 of Revelation here shortly. They protect the throne in that they do not allow man in his sin to come into the presence of God. The seraphim especially are there apparently guarding the holiness of God. And uh, they also indicate, though, in contrast to that, the way that man is to come. When those went, they went. When those stood, they stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. The spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. And the likeness of the firmament on the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched over their heads above. And uh, the firm, this word firmament shows up in Genesis, of course, very key word, rakia. It's not empty. It, it, the word actually means a solid expanse. And it occurs 17 times in the scriptures. We talked a little bit about that in our first session. The whole idea of the heavens being, having substance, not, not emptiness. And uh, so apparently here we're seeing a beautiful platform above the wheels and the cherubim containing the throne of God. And so they're all, this is all supporting, if you will, the throne. Under the firmament were the, the wings straight, one toward the other. Every one had two, one which covered on this side, and every one had two which covered that side, their bodies. And uh, so God is still on the throne. His, his will being accomplished in this world, even if we don't see it. 
And the complex movements of the cherubim and the wheels suggest how intricate is God's providence in the universe. Perfect harmony and order. One can easily extrapolate from these comments. And, as, and, and when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters. As the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech. I think that's an interesting phrase to find here in this dimensionality. The voice of speech as the noise of a host. When they stood, they let down their wings. And uh, I could almost footnote the voice of speech and put Psalm 19, the first nine verses of that, fitting right in there. The heavens declare the glory of God. Every, every phrase there is replete with all the uh, verbs of information sciences. But we'll move on here. The voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech. Remember the seven thunders in Revelation. John was uh, about to write. He said, see, thou do it not. So he apparently understood it, but he was not allowed to write it until they declare it. So there's a little mystery there that I'll leave with you to explore in Revelation 10. What are these seven thunders? I suspect they are listed in Psalm 29, but that's a rabbit trail I'll let you chase on your own. Sounds uh, like the noise of great waters. We find that phrase in the Psalm several places and in Isaiah. Like the thunder of the Almighty, the voice of God, seven times in Psalm 29. I think those are the voice of the seven thunders, actually. And uh, uh, the sound of a tumult like the sound of a host, we find that phrase. The word almighty, by the way, is a pre-Mosaic term for God. It's used in all kinds of poetry, and it, it, it's usually prefixed with El, El Shaddai, uh, uh, the, the, the almightiness of God, actually. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads, and when they stood, they had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above it. Uh, uh, above upon it. The appearance of a man. And you, you recall one of the th declarations of Jesus Christ that opens the Gospel of John is that the Word was made flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. And uh, on we go here. And I saw as the color of amber as the appearance of the fire round about within it. Um, from the appearance of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. And the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all round about it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on, on my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. And that, that's chapter 1. We're going to skip a lot of the rest. Of, we're going to jump right into chapter 10 of Ezekiel because he again picks up these topics to give us some perceptions of the cherubim. And, and so, again, we're talking about God's, and I want to remind you, I use these little reminders that we're talking about a hyperspace, not three dimensions. So we, we, it requires a certain patience on our part to try to understand Ezekiel's problem as he tries to find words to describe what it is he saw. And I looked, and behold, in the firmament there was a, a, above the head of the cherubims that appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And uh, so the throne was empty, apparently, and the chariot awaited the Lord's return. He's going to describe the removal of God's glory from Israel in chapter 10 in the form of this leaving. And uh, that's, what, that's, the, uh, that's the narrative event that's going on here. And he spake unto the man clothed with linen and said, Go be in between the wheels even under the cherub, and fill thine hand with the coals of fire from between the cherubims, and scatter them over the city. And he went in, in my sight. And uh, the man clothed with linen, that's his, 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 this is the, the who, if you will, in this chapter, that becomes the agent of destruction. And uh, it's an adverse assignment that he has. Go in between the wheels, and uh, between the cherubims. And the word there is galgal, wheel. It's a whirl or whirling, whirlwind. It's a whirling thing. And uh, a galgal is a, uh, some kind of uh, a collective term for the whole contrivance. It can be used of wagons, wheels, whirlwinds. It's both singular but can be a collective, describing the whole wheel work. And uh, so as you look at these things, uh, when you have wheels within a wheels, it can be all kinds of things that we don't normally imagine. And uh, so uh, I have a, a, a good friend of mine is Robert DeCilio. He's, he's the guy that saved Apollo 13. He's a legend within the space industry. 
Uh, he loves to talk about, explore, con- had conjecture about Ephesians 10, these wheels within wheels. He tends to see all these things as some kind of elaborate spacecraft. And what I think, what I usually argue with him about is that it's, I think it's, it's a waste of time to try to picture these things because we're dealing in a hyperspace, not the three dimensions that we're relatively comfortable with. And again, the term here can be a singular or plural where the singular is used as a collective. But we'll move on here. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Now this is the Shekinah glory. This is the presence of God. This is the presence of His holiness, the Shekinah. And in Egypt, it was a cloud by day and a pillar by fire by night. And it dwelt in the tabernacle and led the people for 40 years through the wilderness. When the Shekinah moved, they would follow. That was the way God moved them for those 40 years of the wilderness wanderings. And uh, that's what I think the cloud that it's talking about here is uh, equivalent to. Then the glory of the Lord, there it is again, went up from the cherub, and it stood over the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with a cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. We're going to see this glory leave the temple is the historical narrative that's going on here. And the first half of this verse is a repetition of something that occurred in the previous chapter. And the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. And it came to pass when he had commanded the man clothed with linen, saying, Take fire from between the wheels and from between the cherubim's. Then he went in and stood beside the wheels. And again, we have these idioms that are perhaps limited in our imaginations. And one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims unto the fire that was between the cherubims. He took thereof and put it into the hands of him that was clothed with the linen, and he took it and went out. And, and there appeared uh, in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under their wings. And I looked, and behold, the four wheels by the cherubims, one wheel by one cherub, another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was as the color of barrel stone. And as for their appearances, the, they four had one likeness, as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. So you got wheels inside of wheels here. And when they went, they went upon their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the place whither the head looked, they followed it. They turned not as they went. There's that strange thing again. Again, God never has to come back to pick up something he's forgotten. He doesn't need to deviate from one side to the other. He never detours. He goes straight forward today toward the accomplishment of his purpose in the world. It's perhaps the idiomatic thought behind all this. And their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they forehead. See, all their flesh, according to the uh, Masoretic text, it implies that all their flesh and their backs and their hands and their wings and f- were full of eyes, which seems to confuse the cherubim and the wheels. But the backs can be rendered as rims and hands as spokes, confining the reference to the wheel. So there's some linguistic ambiguities in here that we don't have to spend our time on. And as for the wheels, it was, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel. And everyone had four faces. Now get here the four faces again. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face was the face of a man. The third, the face of a lion. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. And again, we have four In this case, uh, instead of an ox, which was the other pattern, we have a cherub there. That may be a textual problem. I'm not sure. We'll move on. The cherubs were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river Chebar. And when the cherubs went, the wheels went by them. And when the cherubs lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. And when they stood, these stood. And when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also. For the spirit of the living creature was in them. And the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. And uh, so see, we're going to see in the chapter the glory of God will actually move out of the temple to the top of Mount of Olives. This is a, a, a vi- in this vision, Ezekiel is confronted with the departure of the spirit of God from the temple. And he's going to see in his vision that it will ultimately later return. We'll get into that here shortly. The word Ichabod, the glory is departed. That's from 1 Samuel 4. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. And when they went out, the wheels also were beside them. And everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. 
So we're witnessing here a reluctant, it's almost like a reluctant departure. The Holy Spirit is leaving the temple, but it's doing very hesitatingly. The throne chariot moved to the east gate, apparently of the outer court, paused briefly on the Mount of Olives on the east side of the city, and then left completely. And uh, later on in a prophetic vision, Ezekiel will see the glory ultimately return by the same eastern gates in chapter 43. But that's in the millennium. That's a long time away yet. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Chebar, and I knew that they were cherubims. Now here's a funny, another one of these places. Both seraph, seraphim and cherubims are plurals, but in the King James, the translators uh, muffed it. They put an S on there. Cherubims is a redundancy. Cherubim itself is plural. Cherub is singular, cherubim is plural. Cherubims is a, frankly, a, 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 a scribal error. But, uh, but uh, we'll get on here to the... Each had four faces apiece, every one four wings, and the likeness of the hands of a man was under their wings, and the likeness of the face was the same faces which I saw by the river Chebar. Their appearances themselves, they went every one straight forward. So cherubim, these composite figures, exalted to be proximate to the dwelling place of God, they function several ways. They guard the way of the tree of life in Genesis chapter 3, they, and the ark in Solomon's temple in 1 Kings 6. They engage in the adoration of God in connection with the mercy seat in the tabernacle, and that's in Exodus 25 and 37. We see that echoed through the Torah. They support God's throne is another way to look at it here. They form the chariot of deity when God moves. They are somehow associated with his presence in that regard. So we're dealing in a hyperspace of probably the extreme order. That's why it may be difficult for us to visualize this as Ezekiel gropes for common things uh, to describe these things. But the seraphim is another group that we encounter in Isaiah. Seraph or seraphim, again, singular or plural. And it occurs only in chapter 6 of Isaiah, but I think they're the same creatures we will encounter in Revelation 4 by a different name. And uh, so the, in uh, Revelation 4, in verses 6, 7, and 8, we find living creatures that have the same characteristics. And so, but the way they show up in Isaiah in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah says, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Brief sentence, but profound in significance. Isaiah is treated to a view of the throne of God. Above it stood the seraphims, plural. Again, he's got that S on there. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. We know that God in, is Echad. He is, he is uh, unified as a singular, and yet he is a plural. The word Elohim is a plural, and in Hebrew, a plural is three or more. And here we have him say, holy, holy, holy. It's regarded by most conservative scholars as an echo of the Trinity in the Old Testament. And we're going to see that same thing being said in Revelation 4 at the throne of God there. But this is the only place we have the seraphim singled out. How many are there? We don't know. There could be dozens. Uh, we do know that each one has six wings, etc. So they are there to apparently to s celebrate and adore and protect the holiness of God. And it's a testimony, of course, to the Trinity. And uh, each one had six wings. That's going to be... See, cherubim apparently only have four. But we're going to see that these and the ones in Revelation have six for some reason. We get to Revelation chapter 4. John writes, And before the throne was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four living creatures full of eyes before and behind. There again, very similar to the Old Testament description. And the first living creatures was like a lion, and the second living creature like a calf, and the third living creatures had a face as a man, and the fourth living creatures was like a flying eagle. And again, uh, we've got living creatures all the way through here. See, the word in the Greek is zoon, which is a living creature. It's not therion, which means a wild beast. That therion is used in Revelation 13 to speak of the two beasts of Revelation 13. They're a different term. And so I've tried to correct that here. And we have a lion, a calf, a man, and an eagle. He's set four faces again. So I want to talk a little bit more about those four faces as we go here. Each four, uh, each of the four living creatures had them six wings, and they're full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 
Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And so these are the same as the seraphim in, in Isaiah 6. Let's talk about these four faces. I think there's something profound confronting us here. In the, we see them in Ezekiel 1 and 10. We see them in Revelation 4. But we're also going to discover they are in a strange way in Numbers chapter 2. And, in the, and they also profile the four Gospels. So let's take a look at that. Vision of the throne of God. We have four faces, lion, ox, man, and eagle. We'll discover the camp of Israel when laid out would organize itself around four camps. Um, one was the camp of Judah, one was the camp of Ephraim, one was the camp of Reuben, and one was the camp of Dan. All 12 tribes clustered three each into those four camps. And we discover when we lay this out to scale that when the camp of Israel was encamped, according to the instructions in the Torah, they apparently, at least in some sense, were a model of the throne of God, as replicated in the cherubim and so forth. But there's something else that's worth mentioning, something else you'll encounter as you study the Gospels. I mentioned these four faces. We have uh, these four faces, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle, profiled the primary theme of each of the Gospels and was used by the early church as emblematic of those Gospels. Matthew presents us the lion of the tribe of Judah. Mark presents Jesus in his other role, the, the, uh, the Mashiach ben Yosef, the suffering servant. Matthew is Mashiach ben David, the, the, royal, the royal line. But Mark, the suffering servant. Luke, neither. He presents him as the son of man. His humanity is his focus all the way through. And John, of course, speaks of the eagle. And so, interesting enough, and those, of course, are the four camps of Israel on the east, west, south, and north of the camp. So these four faces seem to have a significance go beyond our normal understanding here. I want to take a quick glimpse of Daniel chapter 10 as we wrap this session up. It's a glimpse into the dark side of all of this. In the third year of Cyrus the king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel whose name was called Belteshazzar. The thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. And uh, in those days, I, Daniel, was in mourning three full weeks. That's going to be important. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh or wine into my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is the Hittakel, then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body was also was like beryl, and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Now some scholars think this was Lord Jesus Christ. There's some reasons we don't think so. We think he was a very senior angel, whatever. We'll move on here. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision. But a great quaking fell upon them, so they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then I was in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon my palms and my hands. It's interesting, every time in the Old Testament, when someone's confronted with something like this, it's one of awe and humility, face on the ground. Uh, they're, they're trembling. And he said unto me, O Daniel, gr a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright for thee, to unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. And he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. In other words, he's a response to Daniel's prayer. But, Ooh, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now this isn't the king of Persia that's ruling in Persia. This is the power behind that king. This is a, a supernatural agency that's holding him back. And uh, I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I'm come to make thee understand what shall 
befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Now the king, the prince of the king of Persia withstood me. And, and, and lo, Michael came to help. This is one reason I don't think this is Christ. I don't think Christ would need Michael's help. But this angel apparently needed Michael to help him get through because he's being opposed by some creature here that's called the prince of the kingdom of Persia. We're going to hear more about him in a minute. Okay? And uh, so... And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb, and behold, one like the multitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake, and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision of my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. And how can a servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. And, uh, and said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not, be, peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened, and he said, Let thy, my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then said he, Knowest thou therefore I am come unto thee? And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, that there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. Wow. See, what, what's interesting here, he is apparently got sent to get through to Daniel, and he's being blocked by some creature called the prince of Persia. And he gets help from Michael and it gets through. He's come to give Daniel a, 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 a vision in fact, what he's going to give him is chapters 11 and 12, the, the climactic two chapters of the book of Daniel. But he points out that when I'm through with you, I've got to go back and I not only fight the prince of Persia, the prince of Grecia will come. So what we, the glimpse that we get here is that behind these world empires are angelic adversaries. And there is a war going on that we don't know about. There's a tension there. And... Uh, this guy had to fight through to get to Daniel to give him this message. Resisted by the power of the prince of Persia. And he also is ready to encounter the power of the prince of Greece. After the Persian Empire came the Greek Empire. But that's 200 years later. But that's all a result, apparently, of the warfare that's behind the scenes in the metacosm, if you will. And so all of this is a prelude to two chapters, the two climactic chapters of Daniel, chapters 11 and 12. And so... But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in twenty days. Remember he said that up there earlier? It's interesting that Daniel fasted for 21 days. And it took this guy 21 days to get through. The question we don't know the answer to, but you can't help, help but wonder, what if Daniel had terminated his fast after 19 days? Would that have meant he didn't? In other words, is there a linkage somehow with Daniel fasting for 21 days and this guy taking 21 days to get through to bring the message to Daniel. That's the enigma, one in 20 days. Well, okay, we've been through now the Berean challenge in general, but also in the pre first session. We've taken a quick walk through the, uh, the, our understanding of angels in the general sense, their capabilities and limitations and the specific lineup of the major players, we have left the dark side for the next session. Because in the next session, we're going to explore the uh, dark side in session three. The, the origin, the career, and the destiny of Satan. We'll explore a couple of his key lieutenants. And we'll all ex also explore the strange role and mission of demons. And how are they different from angels? How are they dangerous? What kind of vulnerabilities do we have? What are the hazards we face? That will be our topics for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the extremes you've gone to on our behalf. We thank you, Father, that we have resources we didn't even know about. But we do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit and through your word, you will illuminate what we need to understand about these resources you've made available to us and the hazards we may be facing as we commit ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our coming King indeed. Amen.
Koinonia House is a nonprofit Christian ministry that is supported by the purchasing of materials and donations. To learn more about Koinonia House and the materials that we have available, visit khouse.org. And please be responsible in the sharing and dissemination of this information and respect the copyrights therein. Thank you.